So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think we should begin. It's half past six now. Um, I'm uh, uh, Stephen Hillier. I'm one of the vice principals at the University of Edinburgh. And it's a, a, a great pleasure to, to welcome you to this, which is the seventh in the uh, lecture series uh, for 2013 of our changing world. So this is an annual uh, series of lectures that came about in response to the perceived urgency to tackle the major uh, dire threats that um, confront uh, the lives and livelihoods of, of people uh, and populations around the world, not just us. These are threats around food, energy, um, uh, water, infectious disease, the environment, and all the so-called um, global grand challenges. So the idea is that um, a world-renowned speaker uh, is invited to focus on a particular challenge and uh, give their perspective on how academic approach, how research can um, help us understand and tackle these pressing issues of, of the day. And so this evening, we're extremely privileged to have as our lecturer one of our own, Professor Sir Ian Wilmot, who will be addressing us, as you can see from his title slide, on the uh, potential that stem cell research has to um, uh, achieve improved diagnosis and, and treatment of, of a variety of uh, debilitating human diseases. So Ian is currently um, Professor Emeritus and, and the founding director of the Medical Research Council and Scottish Centre for Regenerative Medicine, Regenerative Medicine, in the College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine at, at this university. Having joined the university, poached from the Res Roslyn Institute back in 2005, I think it was, as, as Professor of, of Reproductive Science. You all know that Sir Ian is a truly global figure in biomedical research. He's made many uh, important contributions, but of course is best known probably to you all um, for his um, achievement as the leader of the research team that produced um, the famous Dolly the sheep, uh, the first genetic clone of an adult mammal. That was uh, back in 1996. But this was a major breakthrough in, in, in biomedical, in cell biology and, and genetic engineering that had and still has uh, phenomenal implications for science and therapeutic medicine. And this discovery also pushed the concept of cloning into the public domain and kicked off a worldwide public debate about the the ethics and the um, future directions of stem cell research, uh, a, a, a debate that Ian himself has led and, and um, influenced enormously. He's received many national and international awards for his work and is genuinely recognized as one of our true rock star academics at the University of Edinburgh. So I'm absolutely delighted to call upon him to deliver, to deliver this Changing World Lecture on the quest for new therapies by stem cell research. Ian. Thank you very much, Steve, and ladies and gentlemen, for that generous introduction and for your very warm welcome. I am really pleased to be here this evening to give this talk because I firmly believe that we're at a, a sort of a tipping point in the development of stem cell research, and I hope to show you that during the course of the, the lecture. We have to begin with some fairly <coughs> basic background information so that the rest falls into place. And the very first question is, what do we mean by a stem cell? And this is a, a diagram which represents the key points that a stem cell, when it divides, has the ability either to form more cells like itself or a different daughter cell. And it's because of this particular ability 
that they have a unique role during development in multiplying to produce more cells like themselves to produce a bigger mass before they then differentiate into the, the particular tissue. This occurs, of course, not just during development, but also to repair tissues, so that if a, an organ or a tissue is damaged, it will be the stem cells who will produce the daughter cells, which can then produce the cells which are necessary for the repair. But that characteristic is the common characteristic of all the things we're going to talk about as, as stem cells. When they divide, they can produce either more cells like themselves or different daughter cells. If we're thinking of producing cells for therapy, there are a number of criteria that we have to, to meet. Whether you're going to use them in the lab or whether you're thinking of putting them into a patient. The cells have to be of the correct tissue type with ideally no contamination by other cell types. And you need very large numbers of cells, not so much for research purposes, but if you're thinking of putting cells into a person to repair an organ, you need millions of, of cells. So when we get to that stage, this is going to be a, a, a step change in the sort of tissue culture which is necessary. Those requirements are always there, whether, whether you're going to use the cells in the lab or for therapy. If you are going to put the cells into a person, then there's one other which is important, in that in some way the cells must be immunologically accepted by the patient. Either they have to be an immunological match, or if they're going to be different, you have to find some way of suppressing immune rejection or inducing tolerance. And we're going to find that there are several different types of stem cell, and I'm afraid that none of them meet all of these requirements. The first stem cells which were recognised and which in one or two cases have been used for a few decades now, the, ce the cells in blood and bone marrow are, are used specifically, the cells in skin. We take advantage of when people grow out areas of skin to use in uh, treating burns. They may not see the stem cells but they're taking advantage of their presence in, in, in doing that. Stem cells in the heart were much more difficult to find. The techniques that are used to find them often depend upon looking for cells that divide. And the stem cells in the heart and the brain actually only divide very rarely. And so people had to try really hard to identify those, but they are there. So which of our requirements do they, do they meet? How easy are they to, to use? Well, the... Um, These boxes in blue in the next two or three sides are indicating the drawbacks. These cells have a shorter life in, in culture and they don't have the ability to form many tissues. Um, if you take something from the nervous system, those cells are likely only to have cell, the ability to produce cells of the nervous system. They won't make muscle or blood unless you do something to, to change them. I guess if you're looking for very large numbers of cells, the shorter life in culture is a significant handicap. One advantage is, and I'm sorry this, to use this little short notation, but because you took the cells from somebody, you know the genetic makeup of those cells. You can have selected genetics, so that if you're wanting to look at an inherited disease, you could use these because you know that they came from somebody who has that inherited disease. If you're looking to immunologically match them, as of course they do with bone marrow cells, then you know the genetic makeup because you took the cells from that, that person. That's what I mean by that little phrase, selected genetics. Much more recently, people were able to identify embryonic stem cells from human embryos, having worked with mouse embryonic stem cells for 10 or 15 years. And they're rather different. They have a very long life in culture. Some people would say that they're immortal, but I think that's really going it a little bit. They will grow for a long time, so you can get large numbers of them. And if you do it right, they will retain the ability to produce all of the different cells of the body. So they're incredibly useful from the point of view of being able to produce cells and study them on a very large scale. <coughs> 
or in research or potentially for, for therapy. The catch is shown at the bottom is that you can't know the genotype until you've actually produced the cell line. You can if you really try hard when you're starting with the embryo, but in practice you can't select the genotype. And the second disadvantage is that if you put any of those cells into a patient inadvertently, then they have the ability to form a particular type of tumour, the teratoma. And it's that risk which I think has been a major influence on the regulatory authorities in making them be extremely cautious. It's very well known that the Geron Corporation started their trial to be able to repair the spinal cord. What's in the public domain but may not be quite so well known is that when they made their application to the FDA, they put in 22,000 pages of data. That's making the students sweat, just thinking about it. Now, I don't know, but my guess is that about half of that would be showing that they did what they claimed they were doing, and half of it was showing that there were no stem cells, embryo stem cells left. There was no risk of a teratoma. An enormous amount of work. There's one more population of, of stem cells. Um, and their derivation was triggered by the birth of, of Dolly. Until Dolly arrived, um, people thought that as adult animals formed, not just mammals but frogs, as a, as a cell became part of the skin or the nervous system, it was fixed. It has to be more or less fixed, doesn't it? Otherwise we could just ooze across the floor, you know, if cells could change casually. Um, but absolutely fixed. And what Dolly showed was that if we put the nucleus, the genetic information from an adult cell, if you remember mammary tissue, into an egg, unknown things in the egg were able to completely change the functioning of that nucleus so that it was able to control the development of the egg so that it developed into a, an animal. So that, that was to biologists, the most important point, it showed that these things are not as rigidly fixed as until then we thought. And it made people think, well, if the egg can do it, can we find other ways of changing? Not to an egg, but perhaps to a different type of cell. And it's still true to this day that we don't really know what the proteins are in the egg which do the work. But people have followed this line of argument and made a, a great big step forward. In particular, this gentleman, Shinya Yamanaka, uh, working in uh, Japan. He did an experiment which I think will be one of the key ones of the 21st century, in which he took 22 different proteins which were either essential for the functioning of mouse embryonic stem cells or were present in those cells at high concentration and introduced them into skin cells initially of the mouse. And what he found is that those cells became very similar to mouse embryonic, to, to human embryonic stem cells. So these were proteins necessary to be a, an embryonic stem cell into a skin cell, and a small number of the skin cells became equivalent to the embryonic stem cells. And he was able to whittle that number down to just four. The codes are, are shown there on the slide, the shorthand names. So by just introducing those four key transcription factors they're called, they, they influence the functioning of a number of critical genes in cells. He was able to change skin cells into embryonic stem cells, first in the mouse and then subsequently in human. So what about them if we look at them in the same way? Well, they too will grow in culture for a very long time whilst retaining the ability to form all of the tissues. They too have the risk that if you transplant them into a person inadvertently, they might form a tumour. But they have one additional benefit in that because you know the person that from whom you took the skin, you know the genetic makeup. One way in which that's very important is that you can use cells, use those cells to put into somebody for whom they would be an immunological match. I'm going to come back to that at the very end of the lecture. But that's one key use if you're thinking in terms of cell therapy. If the person from whom you took the skin has an inherited disease, then those cells will have the characteristic of that person at a very early stage in their life. And you may be able to see differences between them and cells taken from a healthy person which reflect 
the impending development of the disease, which I'll come, come on to in a moment. So they still have the disadvantage that they could form tumours, but they have the other advantage that you can know the gene type. So looking at the present situation and looking into the future, these iPS cells were first described in 2006, so they're still very new. Methods are still being improved. I think they will be improved so that they become quite routine. They'll be automated. They will be simplified. They'll become more accurate. So when you aim to produce pluripotent cells, that's what you'll get much more consistently. I'm not going to go into this, but you can use the same principle if you take skin cells and put in the proteins which are necessary to be a nerve, some of those skin cells will become nerves. So going to the pluripotent cells isn't the only thing you can do with this technique. So the accuracy of that technique will be changed. And it remains to be seen how useful it will be. And taken together, these attributes offer us a great deal for research. They will show us how we can have a library which can be used for cell therapy, which I'll come back to. They also give an opportunity for gene therapy for some tissues. I'm not going to go into this later on, so I'll go through this quickly now. If you have a child who has an inherited blood disease, then you could take blood cell, skin cell, produce iPS cells, as the shorthand name, these induced pluripotent cells, correct the genetic error, cause them to differentiate into hemopoietic stem cells, the key stem cells for the bone marrow, and put them back into the child. Because they were the same cells except for the correction of the genetic error, the person will be expected to accept those cells perfectly without any reaction at all. But they've then got healthy cells. So I really think that Shinya's results and those which have followed on from it were the beginning of a new era, which still has a little way to go, but it is going to help us to make a major contribution uh, in medicine. Now, automatically, if you ask people what's the benefit of cell therapy, or if you read what the <laughs> gentlemen of the press write, they tend by first reflex to go to, to cell therapy. Um, and that is going to be an application in the end, but it's the most challenging because of the requirements that I listed previously for cells that you're going to put into people. By contrast, we can use these in research to understand diseases and to, to identify new drugs. And although there's a lot of challenges there, they're easier to deal with than the ones for cell therapy. So there are likely to be more things come through in the next 10 years by way of a drug treatment um, than cell therapy. And I'll describe one example in some detail. I'm part of an international consortium which is studying motor neuron disease. Uh, does anybody have a friend or family member who has this disease? Right. A family member or? No. It's a horrible disease, isn't it? What happens is that the patients lose control of limbs. Sometimes it, the disease starts in the arms and sometimes in the legs. And the loss of muscle control comes into the trunk. And after a period of a number of years, the person will die because they stop breathing. And I, I honestly think that's a worse <coughs> prognosis than being told you've got cancer. You know, after a couple of years, you're going to be like this, not able to move anything south of your neck. And you know that in a little while you're going to stop breathing and suffocate. I think that's dreadful. It is actually a family of diseases. I mean, typically the symptoms will appear 45, 50 years of age. But if you think of Stephen Hawking's, who has one of the diseases, he got the symptoms in his early 20s. He's now into 60 and, and still um, functioning. It's still true to say that the mechanisms that cause the death of the nerves is not understood. There's information coming through thick and fast, but it's still not fully understood. And there is no effective treatment. There are a number of different genes involved, and there may be one for which there is a, a little bit of help. 
um, but very little. And for the, for the others, which are rather different, there's one on its own and a number together. For the number that are together, there's nothing. Now, the disease is inherited in a very simple way. One mutant gene will give you the disease. It's as simple as that. And it's inherited in that way in about 5% of cases. The other 95%, the medics would call sporadic. They don't know where it comes from. One thing which was noticed a few years ago is that regardless of whether or not you had an inherited case or whether it was spontaneous, the gene which might have been involved, in a huge majority of the cases, over 90%, there was a maldistribution of a particular protein, and I'm sorry I need you to remember, TDP43. It's, it's, it's just a particular enzyme. Um, and it was found that it is accumulated in an inappropriate way in more than 90% <coughs> of cases. It's one of many proteins which functions in the nucleus, and in the disease cells it's present in the cytoplasm, which means it's in the wrong place, and it tends to be found in, in aggregates. The hope in this sort of research is that if you use inherited cases to study the disease, that the mechanisms which have brought about the symptoms in that case will be similar to those in the sporadic cases, in which case any treatments that we develop would also be useful for people where it isn't inherited. In s some cases I guess that would be true, but not always. <coughs> So you can see, I'm sure, the, the, the flow of work that's necessary for a project like this. You identify somebody who has inherited the disease, you take some skin, you put in those four factors, you produce the pluripotent stem cells, the iPS cells. Um, there are, looks like there are two or three hundred here in this little sphere, um, these small coloured balls. You can then cause them to differentiate into the cells involved in the nervous system. And then you can compare these that are from a person who has inherited the disease with similar cells from, from somebody who is healthy, healthy and look for things which are associated with the disease. And that's what we've been doing. So the evidence that I've just mentioned to you is that there is a higher level of this particular protein in nerves which are carrying a, a damaged gene. And what's been done here is that people have run proteins from cells down through a jelly using electric current to move it. And the smaller bits of protein will go further. The big bits stick at the, the top, comparatively speaking. So you'll get a whole series of different proteins separated in this way, stopping at a characteristic point. So you can know that this is a particular part of the TDP43 molecule at that uh, molecular weight. This is an insoluble fragment. This is the soluble fragment. M33V is the name of the mutation. So to the left of this gel, um, we have samples from two different lines derived from one patient. We only have one patient at this stage, I'm afraid contrasted with a control. There was only one of the, there were two controls, but we only used one. And it looks a little bit different, but it's been measured and then represented in these histograms here. And you can see that there is more of this protein, the soluble protein, compared to the control, and more of the insoluble protein. So that in other words, these cells are showing the same sort of symptoms as the cells which are seen um, when you take pieces of the brain from patients after they've died. There are a number of other measurements were made. My colleagues also showed that these nerve cells were able to function as nerves. They could generate pulses. They could form junctions with muscles and so on. I'm not going to show you any of that. Speaking personally, it was a surprise to me that when these cells were cultured in healthy circumstances, for around about a week, the cells carrying the mutation were more likely to die. This is a cumulative risk of death, so that the higher line is where there's been more death. So a straight comparison between control motor neurons and healthy motor neurons shows that the mutant lines are much more likely to die. 
Another group working in Japan with a different line but with the same mutation has shown also in, in rather different way um, that cells died in, in culture. As well as looking at the actual nerves themselves, there are neighbour cells, some of which are called astrocytes, which are critical for the functioning of the nerves. They maintain the functioning of the, of the nerves. And these were also produced from the same cell lines and, and studied. And they show the disease phenotype. They show the same changes, same differences, um, as were seen in the histology samples. So this is this same protein, TDP43, um, being mislocalized. So on the left-hand histogram, we've got normal wild-type TDP43. Um, and you can see that more of it is in the, the cytoplasm, whereas remember I mentioned that it functions in the nucleus, so it should really be in the, the nucleus. This became, only became really apparent at the higher levels of expression of the the protein. By contrast, in the right-hand histogram, what you see is the distribution of the mutant form of the protein. And you can see here that there was an inappropriate distribution with far more of the protein being in the cytoplasm, even at the lowest possible concentration at the left-hand side. So that the fact that there was a mutation in that protein, and it is just one amino acid, the fact that there was a mutation in that protein caused it to be mis- localized. So these astrocytes were also incubated in culture. I should say we don't have a, a slave culture with, uh, with students. These cells had had a red, is it red or green, a, a colored dye put into the cells. And if the cells died, then the cell membranes become, would become leaky and the dye would be lost. And so it's possible to use a microscope with a camera and a computer hooked to it to count the missing cells ev every few hours. Um, fantastic advantage. And what you can see again is that the astrocytes are much more likely to die if they, if they have the mutation. Now I mentioned that there is one of the causative genes which is different from the rest. Unfortunately, it was the first to be identified and has therefore been studied a lot. One of the ways of studying these mutations is to introduce the mutation into mice and then look and see, do they develop the symptoms? And yes, they did. And to ask, um, what was the relationship in the mouse, sick mouse, between the astrocytes and the nerves? It's possible with some very careful molecular biology to leave the, the gene functioning in the nerves but not the astrocytes or vice versa. And what they found was, to use a colourful description, is that in that case the astrocytes fanned the flames. If the, if the mutant protein was present in the astrocytes, astrocytes, it greatly accelerated the rate of degeneration of the motor neurons. And so one thing that it was critical to know in our study was, well, did the same thing happen with this mutation? And so what you see here, again, is um, plots for survival for about, about a week. It varies a little bit. And these are wild-type motor neurons being grown in isolation. These are mutant-type being grown in, in isolation. Sorry, did I get that right way around? No, I didn't. Those are the wild-type. These are the mutant-type. It's better. You weren't watching. <laughs> So what happened when they were put with diseased astrocytes? So the solid red line is the mutant motor neurons, motor nerves, and the mutant astrocytes. Where it's dotted, it's the mutant motor neurons, but healthy astrocytes. And as you can see, there's no difference whatsoever. So there's no suggestion in this particular case that a mutation in the astrocytes is prejudicing the survival of the motor neurons. So there's several years' work here of a group in King's College London, here in Edinburgh, um, Columbia University, New York, 
and the University of California, San Francisco. Um, what did we show? Well, the physiological levels of the mutant protein is sufficient to reduce survival of the neurons in a tissue culture dish over a very short period of time. The, the astrocytes show the typical mislocation of the protein and are also vulnerable to uh, increased death during a um, short period of culture. But the, the co-culture didn't exacerbate the, the problem. The astrocytes didn't prejudice the survival of the motor neurons. SOD1 is the name of the other gene which I have carefully not mentioned. There are clearly a number of things that need to be done to follow up this study. I mentioned that we only have cells from one patient. We clearly need more and there are some on the way now. I mentioned to you that there are a number of different genes and the SOD1 on its own. We need to look and see whether the other genes in this little group of which FUS FUS is, is one, do they seem to be similar to the TDP43 or is their mechanism of effect different? But the most important thing is we can begin to look for molecules that are able to prolong the life in culture of nerves carrying the mutation. This is the key point. So that um, we're not, as it were, attempting to correct the disease in the sense of correcting the genetic error, but can we reduce the harmful effect, ideally eliminate the harmful effect of having a mutation in the motor neurons. And with the modern sophisticated um, screening equipment, it's quite possible to screen thousands, tens of thousands of small molecules looking for something which is able to protect the cell from the effects of this uh, damaged protein. Now I know perfectly well that you can make very little out of that, but that's the point. Some of you might recognise it as a web page. It's a web patient page taken from the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And each of the vertical bars is indicating a human chromosome. Each of the horizontal bits of fuzz, of, of fog, is an estimated locus of where there is an inherited disease. It's the locus of an inherited disease. I thought that's more meaningful perhaps than telling you that there are probably about a thousand inherited diseases. There are lots. Some of them mercifully are very rare. But if you can produce the cell type which is affected in that disease, you can carry out the sequence which I've just described to you. You could take cells from somebody who has the disease, make the pluripotent cells, make the tissue which is damaged and then compare that with the tissue taken from a healthy person. So it brings studies of some very unpleasant genetic diseases into the realms that are possible for academic laboratories, uh, supported by patient groups perhaps. It greatly reduces the cost of projects to study these diseases. And you can suggest that it may be more meaningful to do it in human cells, with human cells, than it is to introduce the error into mice and study them, because we're not mice. So this will make a great contribution to understanding degenerative diseases. I want to mention a, a, a different approach, um, which has been carried out by my colleague Charles French Constant, who is now the director at the Centre in Edinburgh, working with some of his former colleagues in Cambridge, particularly Robin Franklin, Franklin to understand diseases in a different way and hopefully be able to produce <coughs> therapies. They have a major collaborative project, some of you will know about the Anne Rowling Clinic, um, to study MS, multiple sclerosis. And the experiment I'm going to describe to you is done with pieces of rat brain, which they could study in the laboratory. What they did was to introduce into the brain of the rat a toxin which damaged cells. And then at different time points afterwards, they killed the animals and took the brain and looked at gene expression in the tissue. 
so that what they were looking for was which genes are particularly active during the part of process of repair. Could they identify these? Can they find ways of stimulating them in order to enhance um, the repair process? Um, this was obviously a particularly drastic um, insult to the brain. Maybe the same compounds would be beneficial in maintaining normal brain health and function. So what they looked at was gene expression at these different time points. And what this plot shows, this, this is, indicates that there was no change in the level of expression of the gene. And each of these dots is a particular gene. Those to the left of the, of the cleft there, there was a reduction in expression of the gene. Those to the right, there was a, uh, an increase in expression of the gene. And by looking at several time points, they were able to obviously able to look at the way in which the repair process moved through the, through, through the tissue. And what they found is that a particular receptor, which is indicated, it's these coloured circles and there's a triangle, uh, are also indicating the level of expression. Um, yeah, so I didn't emphasize that quite. This is showing the, the, the extent of the change. It's a, a log plot, a log change. In, in expression either up or down. Um, so this is one of the very biggest changes in, in expression. Um, in the re recovering tissue, and it's a particular receptor. It's a protein in the cell membrane which detects and binds a particular small molecule and then takes that message through in, into the nucleus, retinoic acid uh, receptor. So you can then, once you've identified this, you can then ask questions. And I'm only just going to mention this in, in passing, really. Um, what I've shown you is the top point, that this gene is expressed at a high level in rat tissues undergoing repair. Now, myelin is like an insulating layer wrapped around nerves. And what's been done, of course, is that the myelin has been damaged and, and it's now being repaired, remyelination. MS reflects the loss of that insulating layer for whatever reason. And, and it goes on in all of us uh, a little bit. And mercifully, for most of us, the repair is adequate. And so we don't develop N MS. But in the MS patients, one of the things that happens ultimately is that the repair machinery is not able to replace that insulating layer ad adequately. And then the nerve uh, suffers. What they also found was that triggering this receptor by putting in the compound or an analogue prevents differentiation of the precursor cells. These cells which make this um, are, are replaced as, uh, over a period of time. So you're dependent upon differentiation from a precursor population through uh, to the mature population and it prevented that. What they also found was that if they gave this compound to aged animals, rats, it promoted remyelination in vivo. I should also have said that one of the big risk factors for MS is age. The older they are, you are, the more likely you are to get it because our machinery is not so good at, at repair, which would be the reason why they cho chose aged animals because the myelin level would have been somewhat at the threshold sort of level anyway. So what they showed was that in that tissue slice, there was evidence of functioning of this particular gene during the time when repair was taking place. What they found was that if in, in that tissue culture slice, if they put in that compound, it promoted repair. If they gave that same compound to rats as live animals, then it also promoted repair. So it's beginning to accumulate ev evidence that this may be a compound or from a family of compounds which one day could be given to people uh, to promote repair of the, of the myelin. So I've shown you at some length the search for drugs to get be given to pati patients who have motor neuron disease. I've shown you briefly an example of ways in which research may identify compounds which can promote the ability of our own stem cells to repair. Let's just come briefly to the subject of cell transplantation. 
not so much to give you a recipe saying that people are going to treat this or are already treating that, but trying to get it into context. You probably already know that there is a clinical trial going on putting cells into the brains of people who have had a stroke in Glasgow. Um, technically, these are not actually stem cells. They're neurons which have been immortalised, so they last uh, for a very long time and relying on their ability to repair the brain. You may also know that there's a trial going on, it, it's multinational, treating a form of blindness, one of the forms of causes of degeneration of the macula. The macula is the bit in the eye which does the most detailed seeing. And if it becomes detached, if it becomes um, altered in any way, then you'll use, lose definition. If you listen to somebody give a talk explaining what macular degeneration is like, they'll show you a picture of a fog. So I wouldn't be able to see here. I would only be able to see around the periphery. And it's another one of these conditions for which there isn't really an effective treatment at the present time. But people are developing a strategy of producing the cells which are damaged, equivalent to those that are damaged, growing them in a sheet and then putting them in at the back of the eye uh, to replace those which have been lost. And they've done trials in animals which seem to, seem to show a benefit and are just beginning clinical trials. There is a approval for a clinical trial for Parkinson's disease. Um, again, multi multinational, um, involving colleagues here in Edinburgh, but also in different uh, universities and hospitals in Britain and somebody in New York. But I don't think that's begun yet. It's work which is heading in that direction. People in the United States, those are the only things which, as far as I know, would, would take place in, in Britain. Um, people in the United States are beginning to think of putting into to motor neuron disease patients the, the neighbour cells that, that I mentioned to you. The argument is that they are themselves being damaged and until recently it was thought that they might be damaging the, the nerves. We now don't think that. But if you put in healthy neighbour cells at several points in the spine, perhaps that would support the motor neurons uh, and slow down the rate of their degeneration and the severity of their degeneration. There are people who are thinking of putting cells in to support the liver, either for sclerosis when it's damaged or because of, because of things like alcohol and so on, or because of infection in, in hepatitis. And there are a number of labs around the world now that can produce cells more or less equivalent to those in, in, in the liver. Um, it then becomes a question of finding a way of putting them into the liver in such a way that they can survive and, and provide function to the person. So trials are beginning to come through and I'm sure during the next few years more will do so. Let's just think what that means. We mentioned at the very beginning that you have to avoid immune rejection. It's no good putting cells into the patient and then having them destroyed very quickly because they're immunologically, genetically different. One way of doing that would be to use some of the person's own cells. So using this IPS scheme, you could take some skin cells, make IPS cells, make the type of cell which is needed in the disease and pop them back into the person. But it, it seems to me that that sort of personalised medicine is just totally unrealistic uh, for a variety of, of different reasons. An alternative is to find some way of having cells which are immunologically at least partially matched uh, to the patient. There were some very important calculations done by Craig Taylor and his colleagues at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. And the key conclusion is at the top, so I have leant too hard on the button, we went through a couple of steps there inadvertently. The key conclusion is at the top. The bottom bit tries to explain it. What he argues, and he did his analysis for this country, so this number applies to the United Kingdom, 
that if you chose 150 carefully selected lines, they would provide a useful match for more than 90% of the population. Not a perfect match, but a useful match. And 150 lines would seem to be a reasonable number to produce. I mean, this is technically demanding to produce clinical grade cells. It's expensive, but it's the sort of number that you could think of. And the rationale for it, which is shown below, is that um, it depends upon knowledge of the molecules on the cell surface which cause the rejection. And there are quite a number of genes, but a smaller number of them that have the biggest effect. And we have two copies of each gene, and for most of us, these two copies are different. So if you really try to match everything, it's very complicated. Imagine five or six different genes, two different copies of each. You have to match ten things, let's say, that sort of order. And if you're putting cells into somebody and they're going to survive, what you put in must also have on it what's on the person's um, cell surface. But it doesn't have to have them all. So if for one of the genes you have gene code number one, gene code two, if you have a donor and his gene is two versions of number one, that would be accepted. You don't have to have a perfect match, one and two. It's just that you mustn't have anything different. I'm sorry if I can't, I can't explain it better than that. I could maybe do it with a blackboard, but, but um, that's the best I can do. Um, these people, the donors, are known as being homozygous. In other words, the two things are the same. At the HLA antigens, HLA is the major source of, of rejection. What Craig has calculated is that 150 people selected as being homozygous at the key HLA genes would provide a useful match for virtually everybody. Stick with that point just for a minute. So a way of doing this is to select for this compatibility. Sometimes the requirements are actually different um, in that some diseases are autoimmune diseases like diabetes, type 1 diabetes. So if you put the same type of cell back into the patient, they'll just be destroyed because the antibodies to kill those cells are what gave the person diabetes. So in that case, you don't have to match. It's not helpful to match. You have to do something else instead. There may be some parts in the body where the antibodies and the cells can't get, so they become what are called immune privilege sites. You can put in what you like. It doesn't matter because the system can't detect that there's foreign there. Maybe the inside of the eye is like that. I'm not sure. So in these cases... Putting back autologous cells would either be harmful for the autoimmune diseases or, or not necessary. So you don't always have to go through this process of, of matching. There's also another requirement that has to be taken into account if you're thinking of making a bank of cells for, for use in cell therapy. Sometimes it appears to be important to apply the therapy quickly. At one point, I'm not sure if it's still true, but at one point people thought that when they were trying to repair spinal cords, it was necessary to put the cells in, in a particular window of a day or two at a particular time point, not long after the injury. Now, I didn't tell you, but making IPS cells takes of the order of two months. So it may then take you another month or two, literally, not figuratively, to produce the type of cell that you want. So if you have to wait that period of time to treat somebody where it's urgent, it's not going to be quite so good. So another requirement may be that in some cases it's necessary to have stored cells at least part way through that process, having them available, having them available nearby. You know, by contrast, diseases like diabetes for which there's an effective, at least in the short term treatment, injection of insulin, um, living with bad eyesight is something that the patient's almost certainly done for quite a while. Parkinson's disease is not quite so critical, so in that case it may not be necessary to have the cells pre-differentiated. And so there, there are a group of us who are 
taking these calculations of uh, Craig Taylor's very seriously and trying to think out a strategy as to how to use this information to identify the most valuable donors. If you've donated blood, if you've donated bone marrow, they'll know your HLA type. Um, so it may be one day that people will come back to you and say, you know, please excuse us coming back to you. Please can we have a bit of skin or blood or whatever it is we're asking for in order to make these IPS cells. Something which would be different for most of us, this would have to be done at clinical grade. This means not just people walking around in suits, masks, in really tightly air-conditioned rooms, but um, the sort of paperwork and record keeping that academics like me wouldn't recognize. Um, you have to record everything. Um, you have to keep that information so that should anything go wrong, the system can go back and say, can we learn what went wrong? Um, far, far more rigorous monitoring of the environment than would be typical in an ordinary research laboratory. <coughs> I emphasize the number for this country simply because we don't know many other countries. In Japan, it's a few less. Um, if you think of its history, it went through a period when you could neither get in or out of Japan, which may have had an effect of causing it to inbreed, make it slightly more consistent. So the number of lines needed is rather less than 150. It's not practicable to estimate how many lines you would need globally, but I was part of a discussion uh, last week which was guessing something of the order of six or 700. Um, would provide a useful match for all of us. So why wouldn't it be sensible to think in terms of doing this globally? Of in effect having a global HLA bank, which would just be scattered around um, different parts of the world. There's one other reason for doing it internationally. Jurisdictions, different jurisdictions are sometimes not quite sure which word to use, obstructive in the way in which they apply regulations. So if we fail to avoid this, there will be a situation someday when a clinician and the patient will know that there are some cells which would match her over there. But they can't get them because there was something different about the protocol, whether it was the ethical consent that the person signed when they gave the tissue or the way in which the cells were, were produced or the way in which they're stored. If they've not been done according to the same protocol, the patient's country may say, well, I'm sorry, but you can't bring those in and use them. And so there would seem to be a very strong <coughs> argument, not just for expecting to share internationally, but for starting now so that cells can be produced according to the same procedure and, and used globally. So what I hope I've shown you is that there are a number of different opportunities which are coming through. It's absolutely essential to make the next point. I meant to mention it at the beginning just to show that I really meant it. I'm sorry, but it's going to take a long while. Um, 50 years to reach maturity. I think it's realistic. Even that might be optimistic. If you take the time to look back to the time in the late 18th century when people were first getting immunization against cowpox as a way of being immunized against smallpox. And think how the process of immunization developed slowly, slowly, sorry, somebody's going to be getting annoyed with me in a minute. Come and stand still and speak into the microphone. Um, we're still probably improving the protocols for immunization. 200 and something years later. Now that seems an inordinately long period and you would like to think we're moving more quickly now. But it really wouldn't be a surprise if a totally new area of medicine took 50 to 100 years to reach maturity. I'm sorry if you or a family member has one of these degenerative diseases, that's not what you want to hear. And I think it's very important to say it. <coughs> 
So just to reiterate the, the key points, we are going to be able to change cells from one type to another, more or less at, at will. And I think these procedures will be, become routine and more accurate. This will give us new source of cells, not just the IPS cells, which I introduced, but possibly other cells produced progenitor populations, which are part way down from the embryo to the differentiated tissue. These certainly are being used for research all around the world already, doing things that we couldn't do before 2006. I hope I've justified to you the arguments for having a, a cell library for use in therapy. Um, and perhaps one day somebody will be using this sort of approach for gene therapy. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ian. Um, absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's very kind of you to be available to answer questions. I'm sure there are questions. Or disagreements. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I'll, I'll start off then, if I may, if there's no... Um, you mentioned the importance of, or the uh, benefit of retinoic acid as a stimulus for differentiation uh, mm -hmm. or myelination of, yep. of a particular of, population of, 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 cells, of nerve yeah. cells. Am I right that it's been known for about 40 years now that retinoic acid stimulates differentiation of, of cells anyway? Yep. And I just wonder how that's being exploited in, in, in generally in terms of uh, uh, stem cell uh, uh, biology. I actually don't know the answer. I think I might worry about what you would worry about, which is that there would be significant side effects because yeah. of this very broad yeah, exactly, effect. Yeah. I think it will be necessary to find analogues which have the stimulating effect, but in a limited way, which right. I guess is what these people will be looking for now. Right. About this idea that you can go from a fully def differentiated skin cell straight to a nerve cell or whatever, yeah. without going via pluripotent yep. cells, that, that's new to me. Does that have the same problem with teratomas as well? No. Uh, no. Um, no, you only have... Um, once you've finished the culture and the selection, you would only have had two cell populations, the skin cell and then the, the neuron or whatever it was you, you wanted. So no. There's, there's a significant disadvantage that if it's a terminally differentiated cell, it won't multiply. Mm. And so if you want numbers of them, you'd have to start right back at the beginning by treating a very large number of, of cells. And since the efficiency of change may be as low as one in 10,000, you know, you need a very, very large num number of cells. So can you go to a, um, a stem cell or a progenitor cell yes. directly? Yes, that's been done, yeah. And that would seem to be, just to, for those who are not so familiar, progenitor cells are part way through this process uh, of differentiation. They do retain the ability to multiply. So what's been pointed out is that that could be a way of having cells which can multiply, give you the number that you want, but they would not form teratomas. I think we might be being a bit optimistic in inadvertently implying that there wouldn't be any side effects. And I just wonder whether that's true. You know, if you put a modest number of progenitor cells into an unusual place, couldn't they do harm in other ways? Hi, um, this is more a, a question about your research career. I've been quite struck about how this experiment on Dolly in 1996 triggered all this line of research on induced pluripotent stem cells. I would like you know, to know what led you to embark on this line of research more medically oriented, directed to humans, yep. rather than continuing uh, experiments on animal cloning. Right, so um, if you go back a little bit further, the institute which is now known as Roslin Institute was a traditional genetics institute concerned very much with animal production until the mid 80s and then it was um, there was a sort of a turnover of staff and there was the specific introduction of molecular biology which was absent un until then. And the molecular biologists elected to um, have a project in which genes were put into sheep so that they produced in their milk protein needed to treat human disease. And um, as, an, as it were the em embryologist in the place, my role was to organise the surgery in order to produce thousands of eggs 
put them back into recipients and get some lambs, some of which had got the additional gene. Um, th the arrangement with the director that I had was that once we'd made that work, um, I could do what I wanted. And wh what that had shown me was that you could add genes very inefficiently. Only about 1% of the eggs became sheep in which the gene was expressed and also transmitted to the offspring. Um, but most importantly, you could only, cha only add genes. And um, the director and I went to a meeting which happened to be in Dublin and he presented the results and um, I had a conversation in the bar um, during that meeting in which I heard that a former colleague of mine in Cambridge had been able to clone from early embryos, clone cattle from early embryos. And it had just been demonstrated a little while before in the mouse that it was that stage of embryos from which embryo stem cells were derived. And so I enthusiastically stuck two and two together and made about eight and thought if we could get stem cells from livestock we would probably be able to do nuclear transfer from them, do gene, tra gene modification in the stem cells and therefore have calves which would be like the original except for the change that we had made and that could include changing endogenous genes. So that's the reason why I got interested in cloning in, in the first place as a way of being able to change animals either for research purposes or for animal husbandry or possibly for biomedical uh, re reasons. Um, when we produced Ollie, one of the things which we did talk about at the time was um, cloning to get embryos from which we could get embryo stem cells, human embryo stem cells, because they, like my iPS cells, would be genetically identical to the person from wh whom you took the cell, so you could use it to study disease. This is when I first began to think of studying motor, motor neuron um, disease. We never actually got started um, because before we could organise ourselves and get all of the ethical approval and so on, Shin Yu had shown that you could make iPS cells and that seems a much neater <coughs> way of achieving the same objective. So that's the series of experiments. And so I feel very lucky. Well, uh, <coughs> I think probably that's enough. We've, we've tested you um, thoroughly, Ian. Um, I, I'd like to say thank you very, very much on behalf of everyone and, of course, to thank the audience for participating. Um, I think you've taken us to the very edge of the new frontier of um, stem cell research. You've shown us how a mixture of the new and the old, um, the classic cell molecular biology approach with the new um, stem cell uh, research has given us a new frontier, a new vision therapeutically and, and in terms of understanding disease. Yep. So I think that's very optimistic. Um, as you said, we're on the cusp of a new era. So that's very much in the spirit of our changing world. Yep. So thank you very much indeed for a fantastic uh, exposition. Pleasure. Please join me in thanking professors. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.